welcome everybody. Welcome everyone. We are going to get started in just a moment. As people are joining us, we'll give everyone a, a moment. Okay. All right, everybody, thank you for joining us. This is the uh, Using Assessment Data Training Series. We are in session two, putting data in context to make decisions. First, we'll start with some uh, housekeeping. Uh, please stay on mute. Um, it, we will have opportunities to come off of mute and we'll take you off at that point. You also uh, may not have the ability to use the chat feature right now. We will be uh, turning that on at certain points during the, the session uh, to answer certain prompts. Uh, if you have questions, we will be using a Padlet uh, for you to submit your questions to. I'll go over that right now. Uh, we are dropping a link to the Padlet in the chat. Uh, once you are there, uh, you'll see that uh, there are uh, columns for each of the sections today. When we're in each of those sections, please select the plus button at the bottom of that uh, column to add your comments or questions uh, for that particular section. We also have some general meeting information for you there. Um, about materials, upcoming trainings, and also how to get uh, verification of your attendance today. We have two amazing facilitators with us today. We have Evan Bartelheim, who's a project director uh, with accountability and data literacy for the Los Angeles County Office of Education and Dr. Tacey Rogers, who's the Director of Assessment Research and Evaluation at Solano County Office of Education. And I'll, I'll pass it over to them shortly and they'll introduce themselves when they get started. As I mentioned, uh, this is the Using Assessment Data Training Series. Uh, we had session one earlier this week, Summative Data and How to Use It. Uh, you did not need to attend session one to uh, attend session two. Uh, we will make sure you have all of the information you need uh, for this session. And um, same goes for session three or four. We would love for you to join uh, those sessions as well, um, but it is not required that you, you do one before the other. Uh, for accessibility, I'm just going to read off the names of our sessions here. Uh, today is putting data in context to make decisions. Our um, sessions next week, session three is leadership and culture for effective data use. And then session four uh, is a shared practice panel. Okay, our agenda for today, uh, we'll, we're starting with our welcome and housekeeping. Then we will uh, talk about putting data in context, using data to support equity, uh, then data analysis protocol, then crafting a story, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, we will end today with an optional networking opportunity. We hope that you all will stay on um, for about 20, 30 minutes afterwards uh, for some networking. Okay, our learning goals for today. Uh, Participants will understand how to authentically engage educational partners in data conversations, identify ways to analyze data in context and with an equity-focused mindset, and practice crafting meaningful narratives based on data. Our success criteria, we hope that participants will be able to craft a meaningful narrative about data for a particular audience and a specific purpose. Okay, we're gonna do um, a, a couple warm-up activities here. Uh, we are going to open up the chat. And if you could please share the name of your school or local educational agency. 
Great. Thank you. It's always nice to see where everyone's coming from all over the state of California. Great. Thank you all. As uh, you continue to, to put in where you're coming from into the chat, I'm going to move us along to one other activity. Data use at your site or LEA. Um, think I see I see that people are still putting in their their districts and schools. Great, thank you very much. Um, now we are going to place in the chat. Uh, if you could, what other data do you currently use alongside summative data to get a full picture of student learning? Renaissance, I ready about interim assessments, local assessments, Renaissance. So many answers, I can't even read them all. Let's see, I, I'm seeing a lot of interim assessment use here, local assessments. Curriculum embedded assessments, district writing assessment and local math assessments, benchmarks, common formative assessments, writing prompts, great, performance tasks, great. Okay, thank you, everybody. Oh, uh, I. I'm going to pass it over to our uh, facilitation team for putting data in context. Thank you, Marky. Um, my name again is Evan Bartelheim. I'm with the Los Angeles County Office of Education, and I'm joined by my wonderful colleague, Dr. Tacey Rogers. We, we've never met in person, but I feel like we've become the best Zoom friends over the last uh, year or so. We do reach out to each other to just kind of share ideas and things that are going on. So it's been a fun collaboration. She's in Northern California. You're not a Giants fan, are you, Casey? You are, okay. Of maybe. course I am. Uh, maybe, oh boy, this might be a problem, but we'll work <laughs> on it. Um, so I'm gonna jump in and we're gonna talk about putting our assessment data into context. Next slide, please. So I, we saw a lot of measures being dropped in there into the chat. Um, but I thought, you know, you've heard the term multiple measures before, um, but we might as well ground this conversation by defining what we mean by multiple measures. And um, our definition, multiple measures refers to the process of gathering information from a variety of sources for a particular purpose. And this is a best practice to use multiple measures in any context. And just to note that given the complexity of problems we face in education, more data, I should say more relevant data, uh, will almost always help us reach a clear understanding. Um, it's, of course, important to consider your purpose before you start collecting data, because not all data sources will illuminate a problem equally. Um, too much data can overwhelm us. Um, one of the terms we might use around here, you might have heard it, it's an acronym DRIP, Data Rich Information Poor. Um, it sounds relatively innocuous, I know, but it really can be detrimental in your efforts to use data effectively because too much non-essential data is really, frankly, just overwhelming. So, you know, multiple measures does not mean exclusively assessment data. I saw a lot of examples of assessment data dropped in there. It can also come from data gathered um, at the classroom level, the school level, LEA level. We're going to talk about some of these options in, in a slide or two. <clears throat> but the level of your data will be, be determined by your goal or your purpose, um, as well as your audience. And of course, um, the influences in our students' lives, they definitely extend beyond the school wall. So you may even want to consider data from outside of education. You may want to look at uh, census data, local housing data. There's some other sources that um, I've used in my previous role as a director of assessment, research, and evaluation at a school district that I didn't imagine I would be using. Um, next slide, please. So one of the uh, sources that we frequently cite um, is Victoria Bernhardt, who, whose uh, definitions of multiple measures is definitely a, a great source. It's been 20 plus years since she published it, but it's still um, really helpful. And so she uh, cites four major categories of data, student learning, demographics, perceptions, and school processes. So student learning data describes the results of our educational system through things like 
classroom formative assessments, summative assessments, projects, performance tasks, grades, these are all measures of student learning. <clears throat> Demographic data, we're also probably very familiar with. This describes uh, it's descriptive information about the school community, things like enrollment, attendance, grade levels, ethnicity, gender, native languages. Um, we don't typically have a lot of control over the demographic composition of our school, um, but it is crucial that we understand um, how to disaggregate our data so that we can observe trends and gather um, information for purposes of prediction and planning for all our students. Demographic data is going to assist us in understanding the results of our education system, making sure it's, it's equitable for all students. Uh, the other category, next category, is perception data. And perception data helps us to understand what students and parents um, and teachers think about the learning environment. Um, what are their values and beliefs? Um, and they act in accordance with those values and beliefs, so it's really important to know what they are. This data, of course, can be collected in a variety of ways. We use surveys, focus groups, observations. Uh, and the power of this data uh, is that it often, um, I think, the most powerful data for countering entrenched practices, in particular, student voice. Uh, I really can't emphasize enough how powerful it is for um, your educational partners or your teachers to hear, this is the perception that, that students have. We worked in our district, we did an equity study several years ago and we did focus groups and it was really powerful to hear the students talk about their own experiences probably the most powerful piece of it uh, that overrode all the other data that we provided so and it's challenging though of course to gather this type of data um, anybody who's tried to create their own survey questions knows what i'm talking about you think you're getting it you're nailing it and then of course uh you may not get the information you want but it is challenging but it's well worth it uh, the final category is school processes, and these are uh, these reflect what schools are doing to get the results they're getting. So these processes can include specific programs you're implementing, uh, instructional strategies, classroom practices. Um, and one measure by itself can provide useful information, uh, right? So, but a number of different measures, when used together, and particularly when used together over time, really gives us much more meaningful information to improve teaching and learning and to improve outcomes for our students. And it's really the intersection of measures where things start to get kind of interesting. So for example, we can look at two measures. So for instance, looking at chronically absentee students and, and how they perform on summative assessment, right? So how do students in foster care, for instance, perceive their learning environment? And do they feel that they are connected to their school? So just comparing two, two of these measures oftentimes will give us an interesting uh, perspective. Uh, things get more interesting when you uh, see the intersection of three measures. So, for example, looking at demographics by perception by student learning. Um, do students of different ethnicities perceive the learning environment differently? And are their scores on assessments consistent with these perceptions? And, of course, things get most interesting when you can uh, connect all four measures um, at the school level over time. And we can begin to answer some of the big questions, uh, such as whether the actions we are taking and the processes we've developed are, and the programs we're implementing, are these meeting the needs of our students? And that's why we want to encourage you to, to always uh, get as many measures as you can from a variety of ways. Next slide, please. So when you're determining uh, the specific measures to include in your research, you're going to want to consider the nature of your task first. You want to consider, is this a high stakes versus a, low, versus a low stakes? Um, type of task that we're considering? Is this for a policy that we're developing? Is this for an evaluation of a program? Then you'll want to consider what information uh, will provide you with a more nuanced picture and the types of measures that you'll need. So what you may want to find is what types of measure will provide specific information that is aligned to the goal or the construct being reviewed. What will provide more granular information about learning? Um, what will identify and, addre and address inequities? What types of data are going to support root cause analysis? We're big on root cause analysis here, and sometimes it's very difficult to tease out a root cause with kind of surface level data. So you have to really go deep and get a broad perspective of data. Uh, also, what, what will help you identify barriers that may be contributing to unequal outcomes? So these are the kind of conversations I know a lot of schools are having right now. And the, the real key is to have the right data when you sit down and not to be overwhelmed by it. So an example of what we work, um, a project we worked on here at LACO last year and several different workshops um, was 
looking on how to improve outcomes for college and career readiness. And it kind of stemmed from what we saw in our work with differentiated assistance school districts. And we realized, well, there's a lot of districts that are ending up in differentiated assistance because of the college and career indicator and for specific student groups that were performing well. So we tried to unpack that a little bit. And you know, in so doing, we realized, well, this is a really uh, complex measure. And I'm sure anybody who's looked at the college and career indicator uh, can attest to that. So what are some of the things that we realized we needed to be able to, to collect or to share as we we're talking to our, uh, our LEAs? Well, you know, as an example of demographic data, we wanted to see which student groups are graduating, which rates we wanted to see, you know, both race ethnicity student groups, as well as uh, student groups like uh, students experiencing homeless, students in foster care, English learners, students with disabilities, um, which of those students were ready for, for either college, the A through G requirements, which ones were completing CT pathways, which were completing both, what kind of disparities existed between groups, and then we wanted to look at also student learning data. So A through G completion, uh, how do you get at that CT enrollment and pathway completion data? Then you need to look really drill down what kind of grade distribution because in order to be uh, A through G or CT pathway completers, you needed to have uh, adequate grades. So were there disparities in, in those grades? Um, we also su suggested looking at perception data because you know, what are the student beliefs about what it requires to be successful in A through G courses? If they don't think they're going to succeed, um, they're very likely not to want to take the chance of taking those classes. Or, you know, what are the perceptions about careers available to them and, and how they learn more? So those are some examples that are more. And then finally, we looked at things like process data, you know, look at the master schedule, for example, what kind of grading practices are in place? Are there punitive grading practices in place that may be keeping kids from from taking more challenging classes? Um, what are the course advising and selection processes that counselors are undertaking to ensure that kids get through, the, through their A through G or through a CTE pathway? These are all things to consider and you can see how they kind of fall into these four different camps. And now you add to that, just in terms of complexity, that you collecting and monitoring this type of data needs to take place over a series of years because this is a cohort measure, right? So you're talking about um, you can't take a single snapshot and really know what it is. So you need a sustained effort and you can start to see how hard this is. <laughs> so it's not easy. I mean, nobody said it was gonna be easy. Next slide, please. Um, one of the things that we wanna do also is to really engage um, with our educational partners. So some measures uh, that you gather um, are not gonna be in the form of traditional assessment as we just noted, um, they're going to come from other sources, and, and one important and often overlooked source of data is that that's provided by our educational partners. You know, these include our students, parents, and guardians, the members of our community, the students themselves, of course. Um, and I listed on, on Tuesday, our colleagues on Tuesday noted that um, understanding and acknowledging um, the context of learning for this last few years is really critical in, in terms of looking at your data. Um, and understanding um, the effect of the pandemic, well, you know, we know our educational partners are going to have some very relevant data to share with us related to this particular context, and it's ongoing, of course. Um, our educational partners have valuable information to contribute that's not captured anywhere else, uh, and it's important to, to value and respect their contributions to understanding and making decisions about student learning. School leaders really need to consider um, educational partners uh, in both the collection of data, such as perception data, uh, as well as in the interpretation of results, such as assessment data. Um, as a parent of two high school students, twin, twin girls who just finished ninth grade, uh, personally, I can attest to how eager I am to get any information that's telling me where my students are in their learning journey, and maybe uh, too eager, I don't know. My former daughters, as an assessment guy, I was trying constantly trying things out on them. I think they still resent me for it. Um, but you know, how do you engage with these these groups, right? Um, how do we ensure that there's a balance of voices in the room when we engage with them, and it's not just the loudest? Um, this is a real challenge. Uh, it always has been. Uh, certainly, the ability to engage by Zoom has both increased participation for parents in our meetings, but it's also it has some drawbacks, right? Um, However, we definitely want to ensure adequate representation of our educational partners, including those who have been historically underrepresented. Um, I would also say we should be engaging of those who are critical of us. I know it's a tough one sometimes to, to want to reach out to those people, 
but it's really the key to get meaningful collaboration that's going to engender trust and really move the conversation forward. And I think engaging your critics in genuine problem solving with real data may actually be one of the most effective ways to build an understanding of the challenges that we face in our schools. There are other challenges as well to meaningfully engage in your educational partners. Uh, some of the things I've encountered is, you know, quite frankly, just building data literacy uh, among your educational partners. Uh, partners, parents who come in and you're trying to explain now, of course, multiple measures, right? So it's not just understanding your smarter balanced assessment scores, but all these other things uh, that you're including for a really comprehensive look. And of course, there's going to be attrition. So maintaining some continuity, if you're looking at some long-term uh, projects, you're trying to measure the effectiveness of, of programs, it's very difficult sometimes to maintain continuity uh, of your educational partners long enough to actually see them see them all the way through. So those are really challenges. The good news, of course, is that most LEAs um, are already um, uh, engaging with parents. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities uh, to engage with educational partners. At the school level, we have school site council, ELAC, PTA, student leadership meetings. Um, the district level, we have things like the LCAP parent advisory, district advisory committees, such as DLAC, these are all great places to start in this question of, you know, can you make these even more meaningful for the for the educational partners involved? Because ultimately collaborating with these groups is going to allow for their meaningful contributions um, uh, in strategizing your response to, to the challenges that you face. Next slide, please. So what are some of the data sources that you should be using for student learning? These are just a few of the examples um, to provide a more full picture of student learning, the opportunity to learn measures. Um, I think these fall into kind of the priority one basics of the uh, state priority areas, things like qualified teachers, clean and safe facilities, um, up-to-date books and standards line materials, high quality coursework, um, now high-speed internet at home if you have students still re learning remotely, um, and school conditions that provide all students with fair and equal opportunity to learn, uh, virtual learning plans, feedback from students and families. So this is that perception data, which can come via surveys or focus groups we talked about, uh, teacher surveys, progress monitoring tools. These are typically you know, used to provide information about students um, who need uh, additional supports in tier two or tier three. These are oftentimes curriculum-based measures, CBMs that are brief and sensitive to growth in, in short increments of time. Student work is important. Diagnostic assessments, a lot of commercially available diagnostics out there that I saw in the chat. Um, interim assessments, these could include those uh, item bank assessments, um, teacher generated assessments. Of course, the CASP interim assessments are a fantastic resource that I know a lot of our districts are using now. Student engagement on assessment, this is a little more granular data that's now available with some of the commercially available assessments that are out there. State summative assessments, of course, that's what we're all waiting to see any day now, right? We're going to get our initial uh, data in SIRS and things like course grades. So um, which ones do you currently have access to? That's what we're wondering. And which could you easily gather? So we're going to tap into the collective power of this group with just an activity. So next source, please. Or next slide, please. Uh, on your own. Um, please think about the relevant measures you have available to help you understand and respond to student learning. Um, consider the four categories that we talked about, the four categories of measures. And on the Padlet, and we have the Padlet in the chat, we'd like you to record what else can be considered. I really, I'm going to look at this because I always learn. I'm saying this earlier to the team that, uh, you know, I'm often really surprised by the kinds of things that people are using to measure success and how they link things together. So uh, we're going to give you five minutes for this activity. Um, feel free to turn off your camera if it's not already off while you're working. Um, and we will be monitoring. We'll come back and look at what you've written.
Casey, are you like me? Are we ready to come back now? It's 2.29. I was worried I was going to get lost in all these wonderful comments. Um, just some great stuff here. Um, and I do know these are some conversations we're having uh, at the county with our districts, our differentiated assistance conversations this year, um, things around social emotional learning and that type of data um, that people have been collecting more of uh, in the last two years, um, behavior data, the suspension data. I think a lot of there's that was probably one of the more fascinating things the return to schools this year and how much suspension. Uh, unexpectedly maybe spike for some for, for some districts. Um, but yeah, all the things that are mentioned there are just phenomenal. And I also, I dropped in the chat, somebody asked, it was Victoria Bernhardt was the source I cited. Um, we actually shared it last year, I think, in this presentation um, and um, her multiple measures tool. There's a phenomenal graphic that she uses. It's over 20 years old. It's still super valid. I highly recommend finding it's available on the internet. Casey, I think I'm handing off to you, right? Yes, Evan, I am like you. I was getting so caught up in the points that were being made on the Padlet. I was um, extremely encouraged by the point around um, looking at attendance data by period at the secondary level that caught my eye. Um, I was having a conversation with a principal in our county, a secondary principal, secondary uh, level principal around why that's necessary. And so I'm so encouraged to see it written here on our Padlet. And there was also one about um, try, I wrote it down, triangulating the data. And I was, I got interested in that, like, oh, it sounds like you're building a tracker or some type of early warning system. Like that one got me really excited, Evan. Um, thank you all for engaging with the Padlet. I'm so excited and honored to be here this afternoon. I'm Dr. Tacey Rogers and I serve at Solano County Office of Education and I'm going to take us through our next section. And I, I do have the palette open on my other screen here. So I find myself peeking at it. So please continue to engage with us uh, throughout the afternoon on the Padlet, adding your questions there. Um, we're going to, in this next section, uh, talk about how a data analysis protocol can be used to make decisions that support equitable outcomes for students. Um, and we're going to start off with, on our next slide, continuous improvement. And you likely have heard this term uh, before, especially here lately, continuous improvement is grounded in the understanding that a system's performance is a result of its design and operation. And we acknowledge that LEAs do not have control over all the factors related to how their system functions. But part of the process to, is to identify where there are opportunities to affect the best change. So that process relies on consistent and frequent cycles of inquiry to support the improvement. And in that inquiry, you are considering how, um, how is it, or considering the outcomes that your LEA is producing. And one example of that cycle of inquiry and in continuous improvement is Plan, Do, Study, Act. And that's the image you see on your slide. The, acronym is PDSA. You might have heard it before. And there is a link being dropped in the chat, I believe, to our a regional assessment network. And essentially across the state, there are several uh, regions. The counties are clustered together um, to offer support. So several county offices have um, an array of staff that have been trained in continuous improvement and are able to support you as you're considering what cycle of inquiry would be best appropriate for my, my team, for your team, your colleagues who are going to engage on this 
data analysis process. And so it's, it was important to us to share that link with you so that you know you have local contacts. And if you don't see a contact from your county listed, the contacts who are listed can direct you. They know who to contact if you want someone who's specifically from your the county where your LEA is located to support you in going through this process of continuous improvement. Let's continue. Um, so data can be used to understand on the next slide uh, why the system is producing its current results um, and what changes can be made to shift the results and the impact of those changes. So when you reflect on that plan, do, study, act, that PDSA cycle that you saw in the image on the previous slide, a major part of planning is understanding and collecting data. And a lot of time is spent in that understanding and collecting data phase. In that phase, you are identifying hunches, you are identifying theories, like why is the system getting these outcomes, and any ideas around what might be contributing to the current results. You're really uh, spending time in that plan, that initial phase of investigating what's happening. Let's go to the next slide. Um, I'm gonna read this quote here verbatim. And the link to the Padlet is in the chat for you again. And what I'd like for you to do is you might have to scroll a little bit on your screen to the column that says section two, using data to support equity. And as I read, drop in under that column a few words from the quote that most resonate with you. It could be one word or two words or a couple of words whatever you hear that really resonates. This definition of equity comes from a report by Wested in, uh, from 2020 titled Equity Framework. And essentially says here, equity is the attainment of comparably positive outcomes for all groups within or served by any complex system through implementation of policies, practices, and procedures that remove systematic barriers and provide the supports needed to ensure everyone's full and successful participation in the system. Equity exists when race, ethnicity, language, religion, gender identity, sexual orientation, age, national origin, physical or cognitive ability, social economic status, and other such characteristics are not predictors of outcomes for any group or individuals in it. Now let's see what you wrote on the Padlet. You're writing your the words that most resonate with you from this quote on the Padlet. I see several words coming in, positive outcomes, remove system, systemic barriers, comparably positive outcomes, not characteristics of outcomes, positive outcomes for all groups, provide the support, religion, systematic barriers. These are good. Characteristics are not predictors of outcomes. Wow. Yes. And we have a uh, 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 exclamation point on that one, um, provide the supports needed. I, I really like this definition, it's extremely powerful and it allows us to really frame um, our conversation around data analysis and why equity is at the center of it. So let's talk about the foundations for using data to support equity on the next slide. And we're going to, we're leading up to walking through our data analysis protocol. Uh, we can engage in a data analysis uh, protocol to support learning and improvement, not solely consider gains or deficits for accountability purposes. Like that's not all we're doing. Yes, we're doing that and, um, thinking about how we support learning and improvement. Data is used to challenge the beliefs, to learn, and not simply confirm existing beliefs. When this is done, assessment data can be used to support equity. 
So those engaging in a with a data analysis protocol must share a shared must have a shared commitment. So that's why we provided you with that equity definition. Remember, remember, you have a copy of these slides, so you can use some of this because the shared commitment and shared responsibility is essential to supporting equitable outcomes and really grounding your work. Data can and should be used to pinpoint an inequity in the system. For example, through the disaggregation of the data to better understand student experiences. And data disaggregation to me, in my mind, in my practice, as I'm working, right, is a non-negotiable. It's essential. And it, as a reminder, would be by student group, by grade, by ethnicity, gender, cohort, by school. Um, I, I am unable to articulate in my mind how we would be having an equity conversation without disaggregating data. And so let's talk more about that um, coming up and we'll show you in the protocol. Those engaging in a data analysis protocol should approach the work with an open mind, free from preconceived biases as much as possible and commit to authentically engaging with educational partners as collaborators who bring value to the conversation. And you heard Evan mention this. Um, he talked about the role of educational partners in his opening. And when Evan and I were preparing for today's session, we were talking through some examples of LEAs within our counties and how we've been having conversations around authentic engagement. And Evan mentioned one to me where, um, colleagues at the LEA, you know, they hosted their engagement session and then, um, you know, had a handful of, or had some partners show up and their minds were like, check, done. We hosted, whoever was interested came, mark it off the list. And you know what my response was? And I, and I asked them and I said, I want to say fail. <laughs> like, can I say that? They, that that is not enough. We we're talking about authentic engagement. Um, I think about my own practice here, and I don't know. I, I'm assuming I'm not alone in this room, but I register for all these webinars throughout the school year, and I'm not able to attend all of them live. So in my inbox, it is full of all the recorded webinars that I did not go to live this year. And my goal in the summer is to watch them and get caught up. Well, one of them, I did have a chance to preview it, was around authentic parent engagement. And they spoke about different ways to engage with parents. And some of the examples that they shared were, um, of course, like Evan said, leveraging the technology, right? We're never going back, right? Um, thinking about how do we maximize those tools that our LEAs have provided us. Um, there was one reference to a text campaign and similar to those text messages we get from, you know, the store or the mall or, or some department store or something like that, where it's reply with a Y if you're interested or reply Y, you know, reply with the yes to register now or to offer your feedback. And so there was a district who used a, a tool like that where parents could reply and offer their insights. Um, there is a district in Southern California where I heard their school counselors present and they talked about calling campaigns where uh, there were staff at the district level who supported the actual calling of parents they hadn't heard from. So it was a all hands on deck type of scenario. And then um, here, in, and I'm in region four, if you saw that link that was in the chat on the region assessment network, and a member of our assessment network talked to this school year about sending out postcards to families like to add some exclusivity, you know, you're cordially invited and, and you've been selected amongst the few to sit down at the superintendent and just really um, enhancing the experience with, with that type of language. Um, offering childcare is what I heard on the webinar. Um, one of the districts here in Solano County, I was on a call just a couple of weeks ago where one of their directors talked about they set up tables in front of the supermarket. <laughs> There's a big supermarket in, in our area and that's where they were. Just approaching people, had their tablecloth so you knew that they were from the school district and were saying, we need feedback, please give us input. And really 
going where the community is, um, thinking about the churches that are in the boundaries. That's when I heard on the webinar, I thought was really good. Um, leveraging the churches, speaking at churches, setting up a table at the church, like wherever those anchor points in the community, that's authentic engagement, thinking outside the box. Um, and, and how you do that relies heavily on who's at the table to support you with that exchange of ideas and possibilities. Um, on the next slide, we think about um, approaching this with an equity mindset and this specific way of thinking um, places a focus on centering equity in the conversation around data and data use. The equity mindset, having an equity mindset allows those working with student data to consider that lear learners, consider the learners as individuals and can help to challenge beliefs and seek to identify barriers that drive observed student equities. Barriers that drive the observed student equities. I hope you don't mind I repeat that. And the barriers are imposed by the system, not the people, not the staff, not the parents, the system. And so with the equity mindset, it requires an active examination of the system and any implicit biases and beliefs about students that might exist. Implicit biases refers to attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, our actions, our decisions in an unconscious manner. Deficit thinking looks to identify what's wrong with students instead of focusing on what is happening incorrectly in the system that's producing those results, focusing in on the system. So again, emphasizing the system piece. So recall we mentioned about continuous improvement earlier, right? It's important to know that this, this analysis of the system is ongoing. And it's not about getting to a place where, okay, we're done. We reached the pinnacle, all programs are equitable, the outcomes are equitable, the policies are equitable, finished. Um, because as long as students are alive and participating in our systems, those students are growing, they are changing, they are adapting, so are their communities, and the system must do so as well. It is an equity mindset that allows us to challenge the system in that way, that way of adjusting. Um, that, that's the key here. Okay, let's keep going. So Evan also talked about multiple measures, and that is an essential practice for the understanding of student learning that results in your system uh, producing uh, particular outcomes. Centering equity means situating student learning outcomes in the context of learning opportunities that your system has afforded the students. And it, it allows you to consider what were the different learning conditions and the student experiences of those conditions. So as we, as we consider the quality of student access to learning opportunities, for example, what learning experiences do students have access to? What experiences were they able to engage in? What technology did they have access to? Were students able to access all of necessary accommodations and accessibility resources? That's, those questions are all about access, right? I, I would suggest we take it a step further. Describing what students have access to makes me think of an analogy around dinner and putting dinner on the dinner table. Here's the meal we offered our students. We offered as a system advanced placement. We offered A through G courses. We offered athletic programs. We offered internships. We offered Cambridge International courses, dual enrollment, the works, we offered all those things. Reflecting on the dinner analogy, you it's good to describe what you put on the dinner table. Here are the things our students have access to. My question is, who ate the dinner? Can you describe who ate it? Can you disaggregate that data? What specifically did they eat from the table? 
the veggies, the meat, the potatoes, <laughs> the dessert? How often were they hungry? Maybe they were thirsty. Did they need something else that wasn't on the plate? Those are the key considerations. Yes, reporting on what students had access to and being able to report on, investigate your data in a way that allows you to see the patterns around that engagement. These are the gaps. What students ate at the dinner table, those are the gaps. Which students even showed up to the dinner, those are the gaps. And those gaps help indicate um, what students may have experienced in regards to accessing instruction and the data you have surrounding those opportunities. It's not just what you offered and what students could access, it's what happened at that table. What was the experience like? Did someone greet them and say, have a seat? <laughs> I hope you don't mind my analogy. Um, consider how clear communication is about the data, about the interpretation of results, any limitations on the interpretation. And that consideration allows your educational partners to understand their meaning and use them appropriately. Let's keep going to the next section here. And we're going to dive into the data analysis protocol that I've been talking about. And now we're going to dive into it. So I believe there's going to be a poll on the screen. Is that right? Are we doing a poll? Is that right, Marky? Um, and the poll, or we can write in the chat. That's how we'll do it, right? OK. Oh, no, there is a poll. Marky, will you give us these instructions? Yes, we have a Mentimeter set up for you all. We're um, going to put a link to it in the chat. If you don't have access to the chat, you can also go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and put in the code 37839888. And once you're there, we have a very simple poll question for you. Uh, if you could answer yes or no, if you currently use a data analysis protocol to analyze your summative assessment data. This is amazing, Tacey. It's like data within the data and it's like surprising and very uh, illuminating. I agree, Evan. We're toggling between Oh, look at that 50-50 split. This is exciting. Wow, thank you all for responding. Right now we're at 50% no, 50% yes. I can't make these numbers up. <laughs> Literally half and half. Thank you all for responding. Keep those results coming in. This is great. So we'll talk through this uh, protocol. It's called the four R's. It's a data analysis protocol. It has four components, hence the name. And it's at the center of our professional learning opportunity. And our thinking is informed learning, right? Not solely focusing on the accountability responsibilities that we have but also the impact of our data analysis on teaching and learning. And so the protocol helps us plan and uh, think. So I'll briefly walk over the four steps and then we'll dive in a little bit deeper. The first step of the process is data review and you're reviewing the student learning results that the system is producing. And this is the research. Uh, we've been talking about this, right, with the engagement of partners like Evan outlined and authentic engagement. That's the research. Um, when engaging in recall, you should be thinking about the conditions of learning that were in place at the time that the students demonstrated the performance you see in the data. For example, environmental conditions, what were they? Were students quarantining? Were there traumatic events at the school? What about traumatic events in the city? 
in their community where they live? Have there been traumatic events? All of these details have to be taken into account. Evan, I remember you mentioned to me when we were preparing that there's a superintendent that you heard present who leveraged crime data in their community. Was that right? That's right. Yeah. And she was actually a former one of my former superintendents. But yeah, she was able to leverage crime data to talk about trauma and to kind of reallocate resources based on the schools in her community that had the greatest need because what the crime data suggested. That is that is fascinating. Um, especially when I think about this broad category of learning conditions, right? That crime that being able to articulate what's happening in the environment, right? Oftentimes, um, I hear conversations around the student's home. Okay, what about the environment? The environment impacts even the home, right? Um, under the learning conditions, there's also opportunity for us to consider the instructional conditions. Did their teacher change mid-year? Did the school site leadership team experience hardship? Um, was there a substitute for an extended amount of time? What programs, policies, and practices were in place at the time that that performance occurred? All of this is recalled. This is the context of the data. Then, given the conditions, you start to reflect on the practices, the programs, the policies that were in place, and think about how those impact the student's performance. What are the possible connections? Under conditions of under the conditions of learning, this is the reflection um, area. So there's deliberateness of connecting resources and data, and the use of that data to inform the conversation and practice. And we think about analysis oftentimes as scores and looking at the numbers. We have to also make sense of what we expect students to know and do. This is reflect. And this is a prime opportunity for educational partnership engagement that we've been talking about. And finally, the fourth area is um, respond. And it's important to keep in mind that um, the response might be in one year. You, you decide on a response based on the information that you're finding in the recall, in the reflection what is going to be the proper response. It might be for three years. Um, the process of continuous improvement is about slowing down and investigating. Investigating involves involving your educational partnerships. Maybe you don't know the context of their learning environment. Maybe you have to investigate that you have assumptions. Maybe that has to be investigated. I was in an interview this week, we had the privilege to interview some candidates, and one of the co candidates um, described her progress to goal, and she's in year five, and they're just now seeing some movements. Year five. <laughs> That's the response that you're answering. You're deciding this is the thing we're going to focus on. Um, it allows you to, the response category allows you to think what can be done differently? What steps should we take to make change? And this process should really be thinking about your entire system and the components that make up your system and engaging in this process should support you in understanding and improving the system in ways that provide equitable outcomes for all. Let's keep on going a little bit deeper. Um, so the protocol is one, one of many. And we saw based on our Mentimeter results that some of you have protocols, you might have heard of four R's, you might have another. And the four R's can be adapted to structure conversations at your schools, at the district level. We worked with one of our school districts here in Solano County using the four R's that got us started. And of course we adapted it because the four R's is, um, you have a lot of resources in your packet for today but you don't have to use it all, you can adapt it. We got it down, believe it or not, to, a, I call it a one pager, but my colleague said it's two pages because it's front and back, but it's literally using one piece of paper. I would sell it as a one pager, okay? We got it down to a one pager. It was for the directors to use in the district to start to 
engage in this process of recalling the research process, reflecting on the practice. And then, believe it or not, the directors adapted it even more. They pared it down further for teachers to use. Um, that's one of our, that's our second largest district where we did that um, two years ago. And it's this year, year two. Remember I said going slow? <laughs> um, you're, you're going slow to really research and understand why these outcomes are the way they are. Um, this is year two where they now have shared it with teachers just in this past school year. And so Evan, what about you in, in LA County? Is there an LEA that you have that use the four R's or modify it in any way? Well, you know, as you're talking, it occurred to me that the most recent use of it was actually within the county. So we have, you know, a, a lot of people working across um, our Ed Services Division and we're all coming together to look at our differentiated assistance districts. I collected all the data, we do a data profile and we used a, a modified version of this to actually start conversations. So we would go in with that, um, uh, without any assumptions, right? We wanted to go in with a very open mind as to what we were seeing in the most recent data. So yeah, I, if we found it really valuable to, to, to slow down the process and to take more time as we looked at the data instead of jumping up that ladder of inference. Oh, that's powerful. That's powerful. Thank you for referencing that ladder of inference. Um, Evan's talking about one of those continuous improvement tools that we've been talking about. And us at the county office, we're eager to support you all on diving into those. Um, through continuous improvement, also, we begin to reiterate this um, necessity around partner engagement and involving the appropriate educational partners here on the next slide. In these conversations, um, our partners have information that we cannot find anywhere else. And we have to ask ourselves and our teams, who has the important information about student learning? Who is often left out of the analysis and the response to student learning? And how do we, who is needed to help us make room for new voices um, to meaningfully contribute to these conversations. Involving educational partners in these conversations is more than just making them aware of the opportunities to provide comments. Remember the example I shared that Evan um, brought up around, oh yes, we hosted the session, check. <laughs> next, <laughs> on to the next meeting. Um, it's more than that. And consider, how I what helps me process it in my mind is the definition of input versus feedback. So I looked these up and I'm going to read verbatim. Input is the contribution of information or ideas, information, ideas, or opinions. The contribution of information. Feedback is the reaction or response to a process or activity. Discerning when you need input versus feedback is essential here. Contribution to or responding to something that has already been created. Discerning the difference is authentic partner engagement. You follow me? I'm getting excited, can you tell? Let's go to our next slide. Um, Dr. Alexandra Harvey writes that educational systems in this country have been shaped by the influence of white dominant culture, frequently precluding the authentic partnership of families and educational partners who are vested in the success of historically marginalized students in their communities. Um, and that's a quote from Dr. Harvey's research. The conditions for partnership that you see on the slide here, um, they reflect characteristics that are rooted in intentional equity mindset. And the reference is, is listed there um, if you want to dive in more to some of her research. The conditions for partnership allow you to evaluate if you are soliciting input or if you are soliciting feedback. This determines how partners engage with you. Do you want me to help you create it? Or is it already done? You just want me to react to it. The conditions for partnership that you see on the slide um, are essential. I, I wonder, are these conditions 
present um, and allowing your partners to provide input? Or has the policy and programming already been determined and you want your partners to react to it? That's feedback. What, when does the partnership come into play? Having the right partners at the table can help you decide. So you need colleagues, you need thought partners, you need more than those in the district, you need your site leaders, colleagues like Evan, colleagues like colleagues at the county office to help, help, help your team think, just thought partnership. Um, you might even think about adding these conditions that are listed on the slide uh, to your data protocol. Remember you said, we said you could um, customize it. So they might be considered non-negotiables, right? Is there evidence of shared decision-making? Is there evidence of shared responsibility? What empathy have we demonstrated? The, right, it's so it's so fascinating. Um, it gets me excited to think about having these conversations with colleagues. Okay, let's say on the next slide, your partners have been identified. They're all at the table. How do you start? So in your packet, there's um, some handouts. One is the suggested guiding questions, and I hope you can open that up if you've already downloaded downloaded it. And the this list of guiding questions is not exhaustive, but it's a starting point. Remember, Evan said <laughs> the starting point, the district in Mike in Solano County, we started with this and adapted and adapted. Here we are on year two and we we're still making changes. You can focus your discussions not only around summative, but also all around the other measures that you all mentioned in the chat earlier. And so let's start with uh, research. So we're still focusing on the four R's, okay? The first realm is research. We're gonna dive in a little bit deeper. Um, first, in, within research, you determine which data you're going to analyze, right? There's a lot of data on the table that we've been talking about. Using the data sources that are available, report the facts. That's the responsibility of the team you've gathered at the table. And this team should be representative. Right, we've talked about that authentic partner engagement that includes partners within your system. You describe what you observe in the data. Look for data trends across areas of concerns, priority areas, areas that align with LCAP goals, etc. Focus on the facts. This is an objective data discovery facts here. Resources to support your research can include various reports. We have the test operations management system, that's TOMS, the California Educator, Ed, Educator Reporting System. Look, I don't even think I've ever said that name out loud. That's SIRS, the California School Dashboard, and the test results for California Assessments website. And so there, there will be, you have to keep in mind, right, 2019, 2020 data and 2020, 2021 data, that's our distance learning year, right? Because of the pandemic, we have these gaps in data. However, that's where we can start. A link is dropped in the chat because I saw on the additional training opportunities page, there are search trainings coming up in July one for teachers, one for coordinators. So we're talking about research. You have to be well-versed in the tools that have been provided to us, right? SIRS is one of them. SIRS is very powerful. This is not a SIRS webinar, so I'm not gonna start talking about SIRS. However, I hope you register for training. Um, remember the other data discussions that you've had this year, all the local assessments you dropped in the chat. Um, think about how those assessments and that data give you a full picture of student learning, distance learning environments, access to the internet, participation, social economic status, et cetera. Um, you might also look at historical data, um, any stagnation, and don't forget to drill down by skill areas, by student groups, right? We talked about the data disaggregation. And when considering historical data, remember we have the two years, right? When we went into distance learning. So you have to keep that in mind. Um, on the handout, I hope you have it open, the suggested guided questions handout, turn to page one. There are questions there 
The Padlet link is in the chat. It'll be dropped again if you don't have it. Open up the Padlet. Let's look at page one. There's research questions there to get you started. I want to know what questions stood out to you when I looked at this and the questions have changed because last time I saw version, it's been updated. So that's exciting. But I want you to write in the Padlet under section three, data protocol, data analysis protocol. Go to the section three column on the Padlet and write in the comments what questions stand out to you? Mine was question two. It says, what data and information do you have to help you determine how students engage with teachers and experience their learning? Remember my dinner analogy? How did they engage with their host? I love that question. I love question two. Are you writing some questions? Question three stood out to me. I really like question three. I wanna know which research questions you all like. I'm looking at page one of the suggested guided questions handout. I also liked question three, what conversations were had and what feedback was received from educational partners that could be included in this stage of the data analysis process? I like that question. Um, I could read all of them, but I won't. I'm looking at the palette to see what questions you all write down. Let's keep going on to the next slide for recall. Um, under recall, you consider the school and classroom programs, practices, policies. Think about the last year, the impact of COVID, what happened, what instructional practices were put in place, how successful or effective was your system in adapting to the challenges of the school year, what professional learning were offered, if any. If you all offer professional learning, I would like to know with the sub situation. I, I, I don't know, but we would love to learn from you. So write that on the Padlet. Um, focus on the facts under recall. Um, you might consider uh, looking at other data sources like your district's learning continuity plan, input. Remember, we've been talking about authentic uh, educational partner engagement. So input from students, from families, from teachers, student participation, student engagement. Um, assessment administration policies, what supports are being provided, what resources have been allocated for remote, remote learning. On page two of the suggested guiding questions handout, there are 15 good questions. And I want to know which questions did you like? You can write the numbers if you like. Some of you are typing out the whole questions. I'm here for that too. Um, there are some agreements on the Padlet. I'm looking at section three of the Padlet. Which questions from the recall section do stand out to you? I really like question three. What disruptions to learning did students experience? That's the good question. Number question four says, what data do we have about student well-being. Someone wrote that earlier on the Padlet around the, the implications of social emotional learning. Question four is a good one. Oh yes, recall number 10. Someone wrote on the Padlet question 10. It says, did students have access to specialized support and intervention? That's a good question. Okay, let's keep going to reflect. Reflect on the... Next slide um, is the next component of the four R's and connects performance with practices, programs, and policies. For example, if you're engaging in a historical data dive, you consider the actions taken between the data points and the observed or documented outcomes. Um, you consider possible reasons for those results, including any complications brought on through the pandemic or the, the learning environment of the students, of the community. You must be extremely honest in the reflection. And it's another opportunity to engage with partners, allowing them to reflect and inform the learning environment from their perspective. What did they experience? What did they hear? Um, input from educational partners, partners, and we mentioned this, surveys, conversations, focus groups. This might be a point in the process where you realize that additional questions have surfaced 
and you need new data, more analysis, more discussion. Um, finally, is the respond. Respond is the fourth part of the four R's, and it's time to consider how you respond to the information you've gathered. You determine next steps. Um, what will make your system more equitable? You'll need to consider which opportunities are more immediate and which will require the greater investment of time, of collaboration, of other resources. And here is where you might see opportunity to really leverage colleagues at the county office to help you think through what is that thing that's going to get us the greatest impact and is the most feasible for us to focus on. It might be one thing, it might be one thing for a year, but this, this process of responding really allows you to prioritize equitably and consider your responses carefully. Let's go to the next slide and we're not gonna pull this up, but the four R's process template is in your handout, handouts for today. And it's a note taker that you could use with your team who's going to begin to engage in this process. And remember, you can adapt it. Um, the template is aligned to the framework we just talked about. And it allows for just um, an engagement to start the conversation, some step-by-step -step instructions for your colleagues. So keep that in your toolkit as we move forward. And I'm gonna turn it over to Evan to get us to through the next section. Thanks, Tacey. Um, yeah, so once you've completed this analysis and if you haven't used the data protocol before, you definitely um, will find that the kind of the outcomes you, you read that result are well worth it. But then you need to tell a story and I'm gonna be very transparent here. When I sat in the chair of director of assessment, research and evaluation, I had to present to our board. I don't think I told a very good story. I could tell you, you know, I definitely didn't on some nights, better on others, but um, you want to craft a story around your data with your educational partners and anybody else. Next slide, please. So in the chat, and we'll come back to keep moving, but what information do people need to have to meaningfully engage with data? What do you think people need to have to meaningfully engage with data? Just drop it in the chat right now. We'll see what comes up here. Yeah, source, of course, parameters, uh, visual representations, and I'm gonna to touch on that. Um, some context, the system and community context. The why, absolutely, why is it important to you? Um, data on their students, yes, people definitely resonate with their own students, um, having an, a connection. No edge you speak, oh boy, yes. That is absolutely, um, I think, something that turns people off. Um, student demographics, the student context. Yeah, I think that's important. Um, multiple measures. Yes, protocols, resources, tools to analyze and synth synthesize time. Absolutely. Thank you. Keep, keep those rolling in. Um, and I want to move on to the next slide just out of the interest of time. Um, but when you're, ed when you're trying to tell your story and you're, you're engaging with your educational partners, um, they're going to need to coalesce around a particular issue. And I think this is sometimes the challenge is like, let's find a specific issue around um, to coalesce um, so that we can meaningfully engage with data. That gets back to that, you know, the why. Um, <clears throat> and it's all for the purpose of enacting change. And inherent in the co coalescing around an issue is commonality. And, and that's the commonality of need, a commonality of purpose, and a commonality of action. Right, so this commonality triad focuses on inclusion of multiple partners who come from differing and unique roles, who all bring new, unique perspectives um, to the issues and problems. That's what's gonna move the dial. So leaders, as a school leader, you should focus on the inclusion of multiple partners who come from these differing roles <clears throat> and who bring these unique perspectives. And as individuals with differing backgrounds and experiences um, share and think together, we know that they will all benefit by observing what one uh, might not otherwise observe. Next slide, please. So one of the ways that I think you'll have the most impact that was mentioned in there is visualization in telling your story. If you're sitting down with your partners, you need to be able to um, display data um, to, to provide a visual representation of a particular issue. And this is something I didn't used to be very good at. I would say that it's a lot of um, what I would call a data dump. 
<clears throat> and that was a problem, right? So you want to consider your audience and the way that you can communicate to them visually. Um, important to remember though, excuse me, <clears throat> that the presentation of data is not an endpoint in the data discussion. I think that's another thing. It was the data dump is just like, and here it is, and, and I'm out. Um, that's not the point. A data display should address a specific audience with a specific purpose. And it's really that way to communicate data that's important to educational partners, but it needs to hold space for additional information. And this was the challenge. It's like, it can't be a one-way communication. It really is an opportunity to engage. So I found when I would give the data dump, oftentimes I'd see uh, my board members kind of by the end with their slump down, you know, head in their hands. And, and of course, you're just the messenger delivering the data, but I can tell you uh, I was oftentimes um, the one that they wanted to shoot because it was really, uh, I think they were just tired and cranky, to be honest with you. So telling a good story is important and narrowing what you're talking about is even more important. Limiting as, you, as best you can to specific problems to address is, is key. And then offering an opportunity for next steps. I think that was always the reason they wanted to shoot the messenger because they wanted to know, well, what's the next step? Yeah, you dumped all this data on us, but now what, yeah. right? So definitely uh, you wanna find some way of collect, you know, of collective action moving forward. Next, next slide, please. So um, we, many of us were recently fortunate enough to sit in a, a, a series of webinars with Stephanie Evergreen, and the next few slides are, are references to her work, and I can't recommend her highly enough. I will say, be prepared to be humbled if you've been doing your data for a while because you'll walk away going, oops, yep, oh, I do that, yeah, I do that. Um, but it's really uh, helpful to think about how you can make your, your visuals much more meaningful. So obviously different data can be used to communicate and amplify information. Um, the bar chart uh, to the left is great for showing comparison. You might want to use a bar chart to show differences in student learning outcomes across schools. Now, one little Stephanie Evergreen tip here, um, maybe if you're comparing schools, not so good, but um, data can be and should be intentionally ordered. So you might want to sort this uh, particular bar graph from most to least, for example. Um, that just helps people's cognition. Um, on the right, you have a line chart, which we use typically to compare changes over time. Um, and a line chart could be used to share changes in student learning outcomes over time, of course. So one of the challenges of the last few years has been the disruption to many of our standard sources of educational data. This has made it really difficult to, to give a line chart for things like summative data, chronic absenteeism, right? With you have the year of uh, a disrupted year and then a year at home learning suspension data. You know, you had this year where it dropped down to virtually zero because a lot of LEAs weren't suspending students. Um, but change over over time is important to reflect, particularly now, um, now more than ever probably, because um, your educational partners want transparency about where the students are relative to prior years. Um, and I think it just has to be framed in a way recognizing that there are some real challenges that we've talked about the context. Um, not all data has been disrupted, of course, so we, we do continue to, to collect data around things like reclassification, graduation data, A through G data. So there will be sources that you can share over time. Um, and then you have this question with regards to new data coming in. What do you do with your, your new summative assessment data? You've got a two-year gap in many instances, unless you gave the summative assessment to all your students last year. It's going to be two years since you have data. How do you uh, account for those missing two years? Do you just leave a gap there? Do you start it back up? So it's something to give consideration to. And a couple other uh, evergreen notes, um, things like this, and you can see how spartan these are. A great thing that she notes is just watch out for excessive lines, right? Any grid lines, borders, tick marks, axes, those are things that can add just clutter and noise and take away from the visualization. Next slide, please. Um, got a couple of other options, a scatter plot, for example. Um, this is good to show how one thing is impacted by another. Um, one way you could use a scatter plot would be to show how the relationship between time spent learning in person and the summative assessment results would be a large uh, contingent of students who are still um, learning remotely. Uh, a pie chart is allows you to compare parts of the whole. Typically, we would use this with some demographic data. So you could use pie chart, for instance, to display a breakdown of how a particular student demographic performed on a particular claim um, above, at, near, or below standard in a particular grade level. Um, uh, final couple of evergreen tips, and we're going to give you some other references that are in. Uh, definitely want to use color selectively. Um, don't go with the default is one of her, her things that with the, with the Excel or Google offers you. Go in and, and customize it, but be very careful when you're choosing uh, colors that you 
are aware of connotations that colors may have, like cultural connotations like pink and you know, in the US being associated with feminine qualities. Maybe you don't want to choose that. Um, and also, final note, the graphs are going to catch a viewer's attention. Um, so you're only going to need to visualize data that warrants that attention. Too many graphics, just like too much data in general, is going to dilute the power of visualization. So use it, um, use it with uh, discretion. Next slide, please. So when you're communicating about your, your 2021-22 data, you'll also need to take the current context in, into consideration, of course. Um, this can include noting that students are using an adjusted form for their uh, English language arts literacy and mathematics assessments, just like they did last year and may as well next year. Don't know yet. Um, an implication of this is, of course, that claim level results for individual students aren't available, as well as target reports for groups of students that are not being reported. Students who take the Smarter Balance Summative Assessments uh, are now going to have the Lexile and Quantile Measure reports available. So that's a new addition, great stuff. And if the school is already using Lexile and Quantile Measures um, or resources, these reports provide one more tool in communicating results to parents. Um, CAST resources are another set of tools you have to support your analyses during communication. And moving on to the next slide. Um, so when you're sharing your assessment uh, results with educational partners, make sure the data can be interpreted easily to foster that engaging conversation. Like I said, leave space for that additional conversation. Make sure that the data is accessible by your educational partners. You know, that's always a, a real communication killer if it's too complex. Uh, all educational partners need to be brought into the, into the discussion, including students and families. And as we said, they bring a perspective that only they can provide, and it's really important to engage them. Um, finally, make sure to ask them for their interpretation of the data. This isn't just about telling them what the data shows. We want to know what their thoughts are, and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of insights to glean from that conversation. Next slide, please. So we've included for you uh, the data display checklist. It's a handout 2.3. And this can be used to ensure that your data display is clear, understandable, and effective. It's based on the work of Stephanie Evergreen. As I said, her data visual visualization checklist is phenomenal. Um, if you have an opportunity to read one of her books or participate in a webinar, I highly recommend it. It's advisable for you to use this as a resource um, when considering how to craft your story. It'll just keep things cleaner. It'll give you some uh, uh, good insights as to what, what will draw people's attention away and, and try not to make uh, mistakes that are going to clutter your presentation. And you can use that checklist in an activity we've got coming up. We're going to do an abbreviated version of it, I think, given the time. Um, but we want to tap into your collective of power, power one last time before we go today. Um, so next slide. Um, so I, are we going to do the breakout? I'm sorry, Mark. I'm just going to break the, break the fourth wall here and ask you. Since, since we are running a little late on time, we're going to skip the breakout rooms and we'll okay. just do a... a shortened version of this slide. Okay, so we want to do it in the chat, possibly? Yes, we're going to open up the chat. Okay, great. So we're not going to, we're not going to do breakouts. Um, so for those of you who are still with us, um, think, of a, think of a group of educational partners who you're going to be responsible um, to presenting your summative assessment data to. Um, it's going to be interesting, right? First time in a couple of years, there's definitely going to be some engagement. So this group, it could be your governing board, it could be a parent group, teachers, or others. So then consider what uh, other data you're going to need to include in your presentation to provide some context for the summative assessment data. And, uh, and you can jot this down on the side for now. And now I just, you know, drop in the chat, if you will, um, you know, what it is you, you think will um, be most helpful for you. Um, what story will tell you, will you tell? What would you want to include um, in your data from your data display checklist to inform this conversation? So just take a gander at that at that handout and drop in the chat anything that you feel would be a, a critical takeaway when you're sharing your story with um, one of your your educational partners. While, while waiting for the chat, I'll tell the, the, I had an amazing board member that I used to present in front of. He was, however, the most intimidating person. He was an MD, PhD, and he worked at RAND. And it was like, you just had to have all your ducks lined up. You know, you just did not want to make mistakes. You just had to hone in on that stuff. 
so I guess I was um, well prepared uh, as I as I could be, but hopefully you don't face anything quite that uh, intimidating. Um, so we see reporting regularly to our board, the graphs get messy as we get to the end of the year um, with comparisons. I know sometimes they ask for a lot of data and I think it, it really can be a challenge to satisfy a board's needs for data um, in its public sphere. Um, making, the, yeah, making the data ordered intentionally, that's really powerful stuff. Um, clear labels. Um, Understanding how to share for EL parents is a great, great notation. Um, how the scores reflect uh, matter and ability to reclassify. That's good stuff. Um, how to use the district data to show progress. Um, yeah, that's going to be difficult this year with only some uh, status for almost all of our indicators. Um, using circle graphs sorted by all students and the different subgroups organized by the four performance levels. Yeah, so you've got some unique visualizations. Um, everything about colors. Um, accessibility, yeah, there's an accessibility mentioned on the handout and that's another thing we didn't have time to get to today. That's a, probably a, a whole webinar in and of itself, but if you're responsible for the presentation uh, considerations around, that would be helpful. Well, thank you for engaging in the, the final few minutes here. and. Um, I'm going to hand it back over to Marky, I believe, or Chelsea. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you so much to Evan and um, Tacey. Uh, really, really wonderful job. Uh, and also thanks to all of our participants. Uh, the chat was was really busy, which is great to see. And also it's really, um, I think, gratifying for me to scroll through all of your input on the uh, on the Padlet. And I hope that that Padlet is a resource for you as well. Uh, the Padlet is going to be available at the conclusion of this presentation. So if there's anything that you'd like to go back to, you absolutely can do that. And now uh, we are going to engage in an optional networking opportunity. So uh, we will keep this room open for the next 20 minutes and uh, provide some time for participants to um, engage with each other. We can use the chat feature. We can also have people come off of mute. Um, it, and um, I'm hoping that we can uh, have a discussion mostly around the um, the data analysis protocols uh, and and that portion that that we talked about. Um, I saw in the uh, poll that was that was given that we were pretty evenly split. That was that was we couldn't we couldn't have made that up, like you said, Daisy. The fifty percent split between people who have used a data analysis protocol and people who have not used a data analysis protocol. And I thought for our networking opportunity today, it would be really valuable um, to, for people to be able to ask questions to those who are currently using a protocol and what they are doing, um, what has worked well, what has not worked well, uh, and for people who have who are using protocols consistently, um, what are the benefits? What are the drawbacks if there are any? And what have you found that has worked for you? So, uh, like I said, though this is completely optional, we will be here for the next twenty minutes. And um, if some if somebody would like to ask a question, um, why don't we go ahead? You can use the raise hand feature in Zoom, and um, we can come off come off of mute um, to do that. So the first question that was posed here, thanks Evan 